Hi, thanks for checking out this message from Grace Church San Diego. In this series, we're using a metaphor for living at a train station to show us that God's desire for us is to shift from thinking temporarily to eternally. Let's be honest, the finances do affect our faith for many of us. So join us as we learn how to live with eternity as our focus. We'd love to hear how Grace Church is affecting your life. So feel free to send us an email at info at gracesd.com and tell us your story. Or if you'd like to help support our ministry financially, you can visit the website below so we can continue to help people find Christ and become his mature followers. Finished my uh, undergrad in, I think it's 2006. I was really trying to remember. It's either 2005 or six, one of those two. So I finished and a couple buddies and myself, we went uh, and travel backpack through Europe for six weeks. And while we were there, we're like, okay, we can do it. It's on the bucket list of our lives. We got to do it. So we ran with the bulls in Pamplona. It was this kind of exhilarating, crazy experience. Yes, I did that. But um, when you run with the bulls in Pamplona, you got to plan for a few things. Number one is you don't want to be what they, in the, what they call the death corner. Because most of the, the running with the bulls are kind of these straight lines with a few curves. But then there's this one 90 degree turn and the bulls are not quick, right? They're not on rails. So they just kind of slide out as they're trying to make the turn and boom, hit the wall. And you don't want to be between the bull and the wall. Otherwise, you're going to have a bad day. Right, Scott? Uh, the second thing you want to do when it, and plan for when running with the bulls is you want to make sure that you don't get— so. The run ends in the bull ring, where the bull fight happens that night. We won't talk about that. But um, you don't want to get into the bull ring before the first bull, because if you do, there's all these people in the stands that morning, and if you get into the ring before the first bull, you didn't run with the bulls. And so everyone's booing you if you get in. So, but if you, true story, but once the last bull gets into the ring, they close the ring, the arena doors, and you can't get in. So you need to get in between, at, between the two sets of bulls, you got a plan for that. Not only that, but just to get there, we had to save money. We had to buy our flights, you know, plan the trains and the buses and, and put on the whole white outfit with the red sash and stuff. And it took some planning to accomplish this bucket list kind of thing. You ne we needed to prepare and plan ahead. God wants you to prepare, to plan ahead for your immediate future, like what you're going to do well, maybe not what you're going to eat for lunch, but kind of your, what your, your immediate future, your long-term future, and your eternal future. And God wants you to, and what you do here is to prepare for what you're going to do in eternity. And that happens by who it is that you serve. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Well, welcome to Grace. What's up, you guys? How you doing? All right. All right. Well, my name is Jesse. I love, I love this church. I really do. I'm so thankful. I, I consider it a privilege to be a part of what God's doing here. I want you to know that if you are new to grace, I want you to know that you are safe here, that this is a safe place to, for imperfect people to grow. That's our vision, but I hope that this is the safest place in San Diego for people to get to know who God is. That no matter what your story is, no matter what your background is, no matter how flawed you feel you are, that this is a safe place. You will not be judged here. And if you are, come tell me. <laughs> we'll kick him out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but truly, like, we, that's our hope is that you can really get to know who God is. And we're going to teach the Bible and we're going to teach truth because we love it and we love God. And we're going to even challenge you to trust the Bible and to trust God. And even if you don't, that's okay. That we are okay with people kind of growing quickly or slowly, and we won't call you out or shame anybody where you're at. So, uh, online campus, welcome as well to you. And we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. And if you uh, need a Bible, just raise your hand. Usher's going to come forward. You can raise your hand. We're going to be looking at Scripture. So, Matthew 6, 22. Now, the train metaphor. Someone came up to me after the last service. They're like, okay, break it down for me again. So this station, the train station is kind of like our, our, our life that we have here on earth. And every day the train is leaving to go to heaven, to go to eternity. And what you give in faith, what, you, what, what you're entrusted with and use in faith 
by God, for God, is put on that train and is going to eternity. And when that clicks, when, that, when you realize that your life is more than just the here and now, when that light bulb in your heart turns on and you begin to welcome that truth and that reality, you, you realize that your life here and now is preparation for your life in eternity, for where the train is going. And you begin to live your life differently. You really do. When that, when that sits and settles down in the, the home of your heart. There's two options of where of what you can do. Number one, you, you keep everything at the train station. This is the mindset that it's all about the here and now, and that's it. Done after that. And you know what? This is, it's not, it's, it's pretty easy for us to have that mindset. Because in the 21st century, kind of in the Western hemisphere, the Western world, in the United States, we have it pretty dang good. I mean, better than pretty any other century, I think. And any other part of the world, I mean, the entertainment that we get. The food is just amazing, isn't it, in San Diego? We get great food. All kinds. I mean, the, uh, the, the travel that we get to do is, is pretty amazing. Uh, uh, unpar- unparalleled. Um, the, we have, you have unlimited options right at your fingertip. Just like a click away, right? Click, boom, I want it. And then it comes to your door like, in hours! When does that ever happen? I mean, it's amazing, and I love it, and you love it, don't you? We love it, and there's nothing wrong with loving it. But if you take a step back from, from, from that, from the train station, is it really as good as it should be? I believe inside of every one of us, myself included, there is these deep longings and cravings, knowing that it's not the way that it should be. There's a disconnect. I think that we're not completely happy because we're not where we're ultimately supposed to be. That earth is not our final home. We are created for something much better. How do we become, how do we protect ourselves, yourself, from becoming too attached to this place? Because there's great things about this place, but it's not all about this place. Option number two is you can put it on that train. It's a mindset of God has entrusted me with much. I think child dedication is a great expression of this mindset of putting it on the train because, you know, if you've had a a baby, you and like baby daddy or whoever it is that you've had your baby with, in a sense, that is your child, right? But in another sense, child dedication is a moment where you say, number one, this child has been entrusted to us and we want to raise this child protected and safe and provided for. And we want to help this child discover their, t- their gifts and their strengths and their talents. And to help fan that, that flame and help them discover who they are and launch them successfully into life. I want to commit my, I want to dedicate myself to that. But also, God, you have entrusted this child to me, to us. And it's really, it's ours, but it's not really ours. It's more yours than This child is more yours than it is ours. That's why we're dedicating this child to you, God. And so we live in this tension that in some ways, yes, this stuff is ours, but in another way, it's not ours. We've been entrusted. Last week, Tim gave a great message about using the image of treasure. That store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, because we're... Your treasure is there, your heart will be also. Today we're going to be looking at two other images, one of your eye and one of servant and master. And so Matthew 6, 22 is where we're going. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. I love that image. Dedicated our, I didn't, dedicate, this is like my son's life verse. Your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So last week, where your heart, where your treasure is, there your heart will follow. And Tim gave a great way that that takes, takes shape in our lives, that if your treasure is for your wife, your heart will be for your wife alone. That was a cool point. 
this week, where your eye goes, there your body will follow. I love to snowboard, and I don't get to do it as much because I got all kinds of kids. But when, back in the day, I snowboarded all the time. And I love to fly off the jumps and do all kinds of tricks. And so people sometimes would ask me how to do that. And when, when I would tell them to do a 360, you got to get enough, you know, altitude or whatever. And then you need to look over your shoulder. You need to turn your head and, and keep your eye moving looking in that direction. And when you do that, your body is just naturally going to follow in that direction. But if you keep looking over your shoulder and you don't, you'll just keep turning and you're going to eat it. <laughs> you're just going to land without your nose in the right. That at some point you're going to get around and you need to spot your landing. And you need to keep your eye focused on where you're going to land. And if you do that, you're going to plant your, your body's going to naturally stop rotating. And you're going to plant your board right where you need to be and it's going to, you're going to stick it and it's going to be sick. So, where your eye is looking, there your body will follow. You ever meet anyone, or maybe you're married to someone who is like a distracted driver? You're like, keep your eyes on the road. Don't look at me. I can hear you fine. Keep looking ahead. Right? Distracted, and it's scaring me. The eye, if your eye is healthy, the Greek word, this was originally written in Koine Greek, is the, the word healthy is hapalos. And it's this focus, singular vision that your light, your body will be full of light. And your eye will be healthy with a singular, focused vision. Now this verse is in the context of the verse before it, storing up treasures in heaven. And then we're going to see in the next verse about money. That to have a singularly focused vision is to have a healthy belief system about money. If your eye is healthy, it will be focused in the right direction. That the, your values and your goals are going to align in a healthy way. A, a, a mentality that says, all that I have is from God. I've been entrusted with it. And I want God to, to I want to use it the way God wants me to use it. In contrast, the bad eye. The, the word, Greek word bad is the, the word poneros. It's like this evil kind of eye, but it also means that it, it, it affects in an unhealthy way the rest of your body. It's an eye that's conflicted. It's confused in its purpose. A belief mentality of that the more that I have, the happier that I will be. And in my experience, my observations in life, that is so far from the truth. That, that the more stuff will never satisfy the longings that we have. It does not see the value of laying up treasures in heaven. The values are driven by, this is mine, I worked hard for it, I earned it, it's mine. And the goal is, I'm going to do with it whatever I want. It's for me. Verse 24 goes on, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the first master you can have, is God. And I love the way that King David, he has his prayer. And I love the way that King David expresses how he understands who God is. In 1 Chronicles 29, 11, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. That's kind of incredible. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. That God, you are the OG. You are the original gangster of all that is made and created. You made it all. And what you do is you lend it to us. You let us, you entrust it to us. That what we have is not really ours. That God, it was someone's before God gave it to you and me. And after we're gone, God's going to give it to somebody else. I consider myself a hard worker. I, uh, I did, you know, undergraduate, I did graduate school, and that took 12 years. So I'm not the smartest, sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm a hard worker. I got it done, and, you know, I um, DIY, I love making my house better. Like, I'm not going to pay someone to do it. I'm going fi <laughs> to fix it myself, and I'm going to make my house better. I I've always got a project going on at home. I have an amazing family that's large, and that's a lot of work, and I'm a hard worker there, and, I, and I'm devoted to my wife and to my kids and, you know, and to my purpose and my calling and to my vocation and all that kind of stuff. 
I consider myself a hard worker, but, and talented and gifted, not pridefully, but that God has given me that. But if I cho chose to use what God has entrusted to me for my own devices, you know what I would be? You know what I would, number one, my priorities would be a bunch of shiny, brand new things. Number two, I would be a womanizer. I just know myself. I could care, I would be, I would not be devoted to my wife. And number three, my, my history and my past has shown that I would be completely consumed by substance, substance abuse. But the thing is, when you begin to serve God, God changes your life. He changes what your life is all about and who it is and what it is that you serve. And he begins to, you begin to see that, you, that your life is a life that's entrusted by God. And he, he wants to, to direct your life and to guide your life to love him and to love others. It's really simple. This is the first master that you can serve. The second one is money. But actually, the word in, is an Aramaic word. One of the few in scripture, but um, it's the word mammon. And so I put it there. Uh, mammon is just the word for wealth, for, for, um, for property. There's no negative connotations in the word itself. It's just a word that means money. It's not even real. Like God, it's not even alive. But at the same time, it has this power and is in conflict with God. That there is, that Jesus knows that there is a drive within the heart of every person to crave it, to be obsessed with it, to find your deepest sense of security in it, and that is in conflict with God. It's crucial to see money and possessions with a healthy eye. I love the way that 2 Corinthians 4.16 puts it. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. I love that verse. Whenever people come and, and, and I pray for them for they're sick or they're coming towards the end of their life. And man, that comes, the, the older we get, the, realize, the quicker, we, quicker life goes by, huh? Realize quicker we realize that we're getting there. But I love, this verse comes to mind for me that though our outer selves are wasting away, and it is, isn't it? <laughs> Don't quite bounce back the same. There's an inner reality that's unseen that is getting renewed day by day. And when our life is right and healthy, we're getting stronger on the inside, although our outer is wasting away. That's not the point of this passage for this. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Check this out. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I'm going to read it again. As we look not to things that are seen, but to things that are unseen, because the things that are seen are transient. What are they made out of? Scott, carbon, right? According to, right? chemists out there, and dust, and a bunch of dirt, they're temporal, they're transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is a call to see things as they are, to see stuff as just stuff, and to put it in its proper place. And there are going to be people, and even yourself, this voice, and commercials that are going to tell you, you need it to make you happy. Your life is not full without it. And there's some things that you need, right? My wife and I, two summers ago, we decided we needed some air conditioning. <laughs> we felt we needed that. You may disagree, but we heard from God. No, I'm just kidding. But we, <laughs> we sat down, and we looked at our budget, and we made some adjustments. You know, we're like, okay, well, if we need this, then we're going to make some adjustments. We're not going to spend it on this then. And we got it. There's some things, there's absolutely things that we need, but then there's other things that we don't really need. And we need, you need to be careful because the God of mammon, which is just this word, it's not even really a God. It's an idol. Stone. It will put its hooks in your heart. And Jesus is aware of that. I like the image of like a, a fish on a hooking line, on a, on, a, on a line. That fish is out of its control. It is getting pulled in directions that it doesn't want to go. It is dominated by the thing in its mouth, and it will, this will dominate your life. The marching orders of God and, and mammon 
are in two entirely different directions, and you can't have it both ways. Jesus says you will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. They are in conflict with each other, and either you will control it, or it will control you. And this is determined by who it is that you serve, who your master is. You must make it serve you. Use money rather than letting money dominate you. Use it to love other people. Do you know where you're... Let me ask you a question. I'm going to get my coffee for, for a moment while you sit on this one. When you get to the end of the month and you look back on your month, do you know where your money has gone? Or do you get to the end of the month and you're like, I don't know where my money w- went. I know I had some in there to start with, and now it's gone, and I can't wait for it to get filled back up. Regardless, and this is regardless if you have a lot of it or a little, or not much of it at all. This is so important. Do you know where your money's gone at the end of the month? Or are you someone who tells every dollar where it's going to go? Do you have control of it? Has God given you control of your finances? Matthew 24 and 25 is about your eternal future. And in Matthew 25, Jesus teaches three parables. The first one is the parable of the ten virgins. And the, really the point of that is live every day like it's your last. Be ready. The second one is about the parable of the talents. And the third one is the sheep and the goats. And let me just like, spoiler alert, you want to be a sheep. You don't want to be a goat. And if you don't know the passage, I encourage you to read it. Matthew 25. It will probably blow your mind if you're not familiar with it and probably make you love Jesus a little bit more, which is what we're trying to do, of the characteristics of what it means to be a sheep. It's amazing, the heart of God. That's not what I want to talk about, though. In the story of the talents, you have a businessman who entrusts his wealth to three servants. And he goes, on, goes away, and then he comes back. And he evaluates... And then rewards each servant according to what they've done with what they were entrusted with. They're called the talents. And in Matthew 25, 21, to those who were responsible with what they were given, these are the words to them. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You see, at the end of your life, there will be a moment where you will be evaluated and rewarded based on what you are entrusted with and this, at this point in your life at the train station. And even simple, simple daily decisions, when, you, when this clicks for you, can have eternal significance for your life and for your future. But even for your daily life, if you've been entrusted to take care of children, that that has more purpose than just like, okay, I needed this is the daily grind. I want to scream. Or, what, or you, whatever it is that you've been entrusted with, with your gifts and talents. Let me give you an example. Uh, and there, before we get there, if you treat everything as entrusted to God, you're going to hear three promises in your future self. Number one, you're going to get an affirmation from God. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to hear that. I want to hear that. Number two, you're going to get a promotion with greater responsibility. I will set you over much because you've been faithful with little. Marcus Buckingham, he's an author and, uh, about leadership and management and how to make organizations better. And I was recently listening, uh, listening to an audiobook, And he says that one of a manager's job is to take someone's talent and to transform that into production. And I think that is absolutely what Jesus is saying here, that you, every one of us have been given talent and gifts, and personality, even if you're so extrovert, introvert, feeler, thinker, intuitive, um, perceiving. Whatever, wherever you land, whatever kind of defines your temperament or your strengths, that deep down God has given that to you and is a, and is a, and is a gift, an opportunity. It doesn't matter if you're introverted or extroverted. You need to take that talent and turn it into something that can be produced. So a couple weeks ago, I met this guy named Ryan. He came and just up here and said, hey, my name's Ryan. 
young guy, college student. He's like, I go to UCSD. So we had that cool thing because I'm an alumni from there. And he, um, he's like, I want to talk to you about discipleship. And I, I'm trying to figure out how to share Jesus with my friends. When I hear that, my ears perk up. I'm like, I want to hang out with you. You're the kind of person I like to chill with. And so we hung out last week. And uh, Ryan began to share with me how he's a part of the college group here at Grace. And uh, how they're studying 1 Corinthians. And how he f- believes he discovered one of his gifts. Encouragement. And I could see it in his eye. He's, a, he, he's on the tennis team at UCSD. So he's like in good shape or whatever. And he just, he wants to use his skills and his gifts for God, he's, he's like, I want to be a tennis coach of kids when I get up and I, or when I get older. And I want to just be an encourager to these kids. It's like, and I can see that he's found a sense of his purpose and his calling and, and that God's a part of it. He also said, I signed up to be a driver to, for the tennis team. He's older. And most, a lot of the, the tennis team kids are freshmen. And he sees, his influ- he sees himself as influential in their lives. So we spent most of our time together this last week talking about how to have a conversation in that car ride. That is why he signed up to be a driver, to talk about things that matter and ultimately to talk, to share the gospel. I was like, bro, you are the bomb. And he, and we talked about things that matter. What, you want to know what's on college students' minds? Sex. We talked about how to, how to have that conversation and, and, and how, how God has such an amazing perspective on that and, and a number of other things as well. And Ryan has this light and is driven with a singular focus. And I don't even know if he fully realizes it, but he is laying up treasures in heaven with his life. There is a future, this future place will have governing realities. It's not just going to be hanging out on clouds playing whatever those things are. Guitars. Will you, and I say this with all honesty, when you get to that point, will you be entrusted with more? The third thing you'll hear is you'll be honored with celebration. Enter into the joy of your master. How do you change masters? I want to talk about four ways that you can shift and kind of get closer to letting God be, Jesus be your master. Number one, you need to see things as they are. You need to take a hard look at reality. Is more going in? Or coming out at the end of the month. Because if you want to change your bottom line, you want to get out of debt, it's really simple. You either need to make more money or you need to spend less of it. (laughs) It's like that simple. But it's not that easy, is it? Is more going in or coming out? You need to figure that out. Are you able to say, yeah, I I know where my money is going and I'm going to make adjustments Based on that, you need to tell your money where it's going to go. Jesus is not asking you to commit professional suicide. He's not asking, like, he's asking you to be rational with your finances. And a couple weeks ago, I think, I'm pretty sure Tim preached it here, or Scott, but I preached it out east, um, about the rich man who Jesus said, go sell all of your possessions and come follow me. I think that was for him. That's not for the majority of us. That, that might be for you. I've talked to people about that. Anyways, um, he's, not, he, he's telling us to be rational. You need to make a budget. You need to stare reality in the face and make a plan. Uh, last week, we printed these out for everybody and put them in your programs. Just a Dave Ramsey quick start budget, right? If you lost it or you're new or didn't come last week, that's all good. We've got to, to save paper. We just printed some out. They're on the Bible racks in the back of the auditorium. You can grab one and start making a budget. Number one, it's amazing how quickly you can pay off debt if you start working it into your budget. This snowball, right? Debt snowball, FPU, people. All right, all right. There's a few. A few more need to go. Anyways, that, this, it's amazing how quickly you can pay off debt. And I could tell you story after story of my own personal life with my marriage with my wife. And the freedom and how amazing these, how, how, how much room is made in your budget when you pay off debt. You need a budget for yourself. My wife and I, from the moment we were married, 10 years in January, anyways, uh, we created a fun account for both of us. 
we get cash every two weeks, and I can spend it on whatever I want, almost, pretty much. And my wife can care less what I spend it on. And it's so awesome. I don't feel bad about spending that money. And we just had a conversation last week in light of this, trying to see if we can raise that a little bit. And we don't feel guilty about her buying shoes or me buying, you know, I don't know, whatever it is that I buy with that money. <laughs> Sorry for it. Because it's planned out ahead of time and we have a budget for everything. I mean, we try our best to tell every dollar where it goes. You need to decide, uh, oh yeah, let me step back. If you're just checking us out, new to Grace, this, you know, I'm glad you're here and it's, I'm, it's courageous to come to a new place. Um, but if you are a part of this church and this is home base for you and you love what God's doing here and you, this is where you, this is where God speaks into your life. I want you to know ahead of time, next week, we are going to ask you to consider, and we're not going to make you, we're not, it's not public, but we're going to ask you to give to grace, to what God's doing here. So there's no, like, I already know what that number is in my head. And I'm going to come ready to make that commitment. And, and again, we're not going to ask, we're not going to identify anybody, but we are going to ask. Because we believe it's right. And it's important. And guess who's going to be preaching? Not me. <laughs> so Tim will do it. So anyways, that will be cool. But I want you to know ahead of time. So that, that's part of, so yeah. Um. Even if you're broke as a joke, this can be for you. Because when I was a college student, li living off of um, student loans, yeah, paid those off. <laughs> uh, and working a minimum wage job, valet driver, I still gave 40 bucks a month. It was 10 bucks a week, $2, I don't even know what that is. I gave that because there was, it was training my heart, shaping my heart to know how to be generous and to give the things that I believe that God is in. The second way to change masters is to trust God with your finances no matter what happens. When I finished UCSD, I made a decision that was not good for my bottom line. I decided to go into ministry and work as a college pastor, like a missionary with InterVarsity. And the guy who was like singing right up here, I didn't tell Jason I was going to do this. I don't even know if he's here. The guy that was singing right here with the beard, he works for InterVarsity. And he's a missionary, and he's raising support. So anyways, I'm going to put a plug for him. If you've got extra money, you can throw it at Jason. Come find him after the service. I didn't tell him I was going to do that. But I love what he's doing. Missionary on the college campus. But when I decided to do that same thing, it was not good for my bottom line. And ever since, every month, our margins, I mean, I can tell you story after story of how tight it has been for us. But we've trusted God with our finances every step of the way, and God has been faithful to us. And it is amazing how God brings peace into your heart and provides for you in amazing radical ways that you probably will never be able to experience without trusting God in that way. You want to know what the next verse is right after you can't serve God in money? Therefore, do not be anxious with your life. In light of that, because money has a, a control over our heart, do not be anxious. Next week, Tim is going to be talking about decreasing anxiety in your life and also the millennial kingdom. I don't know how that's going to work, but that's what he's talking about next week. It's going to be awesome. So um, there's an assurance that God has that he will provide for his people. It's a promise that he has made. The third way how to change masters is to daily seek things that are above and not things that are on earth. Colossians 3.1. If then you have been raised with Christ, cool image of what happens when you give your life to Jesus. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above not on things that are on earth. Like I said, God uses money. Not just money, but man, does he use money to test us, to teach you 
how to trust him. And I understand for some of you, this will be one of the hardest tests, ways for you to trust God. I understand that. But when you start putting it on the train, when you start dedicating your kids to God and using your skills for him and start using your possessions and all of that stuff, your money, and seeing it in light of eternity, your heart starts going there in more and more powerful ways. You're like there, and it's amazing. You want more of it. Fourth way is to put it on the train. Can you imagine if all of us decided to trust God in this way? And this is not... This is, this is entirely for God and for his kingdom. What kind of church we would be defined as, we would be marked as, if we're like, we are trusting God in this way. We're a generous people. How that would affect this church internally, but what that would say to the world outside that Jesus is the real deal and is moving in a powerful way. What would that look like? It'd be amazing. If we all t- took a step forward and trusted God in that way. One day you will be asked two questions. And I don't know exactly how it's going to be asked. But something like this. The first question you will be asked, what did you do with my son, Jesus? And your answer, it, the answer that God the Father is not looking for is you have all your systematic theology all lined up. Or you have your doctrinal position all propered in place. Or that you grew up with the right family in some sort of religious background. That ain't going to do it. How you answer that question means everything for where you're going to spend the rest of your eternity. And it has everything to do with, did you accept Jesus, my son, into your heart, into your life? Did you let him forgive you of your sin? Did you learn to trust him with your life? The second question you will be asked is what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with your talents and your opportunities and your energy and your relationships? What did you do with, what did you do with all that? Did you use it for yourself or did you use it for things that matter? And how you answer that second question. It won't determine where you go, but it will determine how it goes for you when you get there. If today... That first question, you don't have assurance and confidence that you've been able to answer that question. That's because of Jesus that I should that I am able to be with God in heaven. We're going to say a simple prayer. And you can pray that prayer in the quietness of your own heart. No one's going to know, but God's going to hear it. And he loves it. <laughs> and he will respond to it and, and forgive you and come into your life and make you new. So if you want to pray that prayer, we can all bow our heads right now and you can receive, pray this prayer and receive Jesus into your heart.